act because it is about recognizing that the shadow itself is not the problem. It's the uh, resistance to feeling the feelings that we feel, to seeing the aspects of ourselves that, that we may not like or we may feel shame about or what have you. That's the problem. And um, and once once people start to recognize, once I start to recognize you, the people that we work with, that these are all just aspects of ourselves. Uh, this is Ed Cardinal of the Cardinal Way for Men, and this is my next edition of the Next Man Up: Transformational Candid Conversations with Men. And it's my honor and privilege to have George as my guest today, and. I met George just recently, actually. He he saw one of my other interviews with, with Calvin and said someone that he knows uh, back in, in Connecticut, uh, up in the area where I used to live. And uh, so we, we connected, had a phone conversation. And during that phone conversation, it was very evident that there was uh, very much alignment in a lot of our paths, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, our passions in life. And I'm really looking forward to uh, to this conversation. Thanks, George, for joining me today. Happy to be here, Ed. Thanks so much for uh, for having me here. What, I, what uh, I would share I would share exactly the same sentiments. I mean, in our conversation the other day, I think I think we have a lot in alignment with each other. It's nice to hear. Yes, absolutely. Well, one of the things we have in in common is re recovery, recovering from from addiction. So why don't, why don't we start there? Uh, this this is, uh, you know, the purpose and the mission for me of these conversations is to help help men, uh, who, particularly who are in in recovery. Uh, so maybe you can tell a little bit of of your story. How long have you been sober? Uh, what that path looks like for you? Yeah. Um... Wow, it, it's actually been it's actually been a while. Um, I got sober June tenth, nineteen seventy five. Uh, in the eleven or so years that I was actively alcoholic and addict, um, I really ingested a lifetime of of uh, poison, and um, and it led me to homelessness and living on the street and unemployability and, you know, all the things. Um, but really what, what I think was the, the gift, the, I don't know, the, the magic in it was <clears throat> that it, it really showed me that, that um, I had no idea how to live my life. You know, I had been depressed most of my life and didn't know it because I didn't know what it was. I was a kid. <laughs> um and uh, and in drugs and alcohol, I found myself and then lost myself again and recognized that, you know, I wanted to live, but I definitely did not want to live the way I was living. Mm. And so it's not that I wanted to die from the standpoint of killing myself or anything like that, although I did attempt suicide. Um but I, I, I just didn't want to live the way I was living. And I, I didn't know if there was another way that I could survive because what I was trying to avoid, what I was trying to leave behind felt as bad as whatever I was experiencing with the drugs and alcohol, you know? Um, so I was lucky enough to find somebody who led me to a 12 step fellowship program and I didn't believe that it would work for me, but I saw that it was working for others. So I said, well, <laughs> at this point, I have nothing to lose. So I'll give it a shot and see what happens. And now 47, 40, whatever years it is later, here I am. Wow, that's amazing. How, how old were you, George? When I was 27 when I came into recovery. That's amazing. That, yeah. Similar yeah. to me, I was 26. Were you? Yeah. Yes. 26 years old. Uh, I was very grateful that I was that young. Um, yeah. You know, yeah you, you absolutely. Hear so many people in the, in the, in AA and who spent years and years out there struggling. Uh, yeah. And um, I'm just grateful that for me, it wasn't that, that long. And, and um, I had that realization like you, 
I didn't, I didn't want to live. I, I knew that if I continued to live the life I was living, I wasn't going to uh, fulfill my purpose and my mission. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and, and it seems to me that you have uh, a, an amazing mission to, to help people. And so, so you got, you got sober, mm -hmm. you were going to AA meetings how did the journey of recovery look for you? Uh, you know, it's, it actually touches me to this day. So much of what has happened for me in, in recovery uh, really touches me in that um, the, the right people, whatever that means, but the right people for me, kept showing up. And my first sponsor was exactly who I needed uh, at the time. And, and he, he was a nurturing man, um, you know, really, uh, he was, he was kind, he wasn't the hard, you know, there's, there's harsh, uh, you know, harsh sponsors, there's kind sponsors, there's loving sponsors, there's kicking the ass sponsors, lots of different kinds. And, and I love them all. But I'm very grateful that I got the one that I got because I probably wouldn't have listened uh, to a drill sergeant. Right. Uh, right. And, um, and so he, he welcomed me into life, so to speak, because as I said, I, I didn't know how to live. Um. And um, even down to one of my favorite stories with him is, you know, he was from the South and, and every, every Southern gentleman is supposed to know how to make a good pecan pie. <laughs> so he took the time to teach me how to make a pecan pie from scratch, wow. taking bitter nibs out of the pecans and all of that. And, um, you know, who does that? Who takes the time to do something like that? But that's, that's the kind of of um, fathering, really, that I needed. It's the kind of fathering that I never got. Right. And um, and so, and then uh, I I was still unemployable. It took me a couple of years of recovery before I could get a job. Um, my reputation was it, it always preceded me. And uh, so I, I took some time to illustrate a book and I went up to Maine to do it and met the man who 10 years later would become my second sponsor when my first sponsor uh, moved and, and fairly, fairly quickly after that died. Um, and, uh, and my second sponsor was, again, not, not a really tough, hard-nosed man, but he was brutally honest. And one of my favorite stories of him was was he said, um, "I want to talk. Let's let's go for a ride." I said, "Sure." He said, "Show me the keys. I'm taking your car and I'm driving." <laughs> so I threw him the keys, and he said, "Any idea why why I wanted to drive and and um, and use your car?" And I said, "No." So he said, "You're very manipulative with your eyes," and. What you do is you con people with your eyes. And I knew that if I looked at you, you would find a way to bullshit me and I'd buy into it. So I, by my driving, I don't have to look at you. And this was the first time somebody really cut to the chase and called me on my crap, you know, and I hated him for it and loved him for it at the same time. You know, he, he really saved my life. Mm. Um so, um, yeah, it, uh, I, I, I've been very blessed to have men like that um, give me different kinds of fathering and, and really bring me into discovering who I am and who I'm capable of being. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's amazing every time I talk to you that the, the similarities and, and for, for me, the same thing. I mean, didn't have a strong connection to my father. So learn how to be a man in recovery from different men who, uh, you know, I'm really grateful to have in, in my life. And uh, so, so growing up, what were the messages that you received on what it meant to be a, a man before you got into recovery? Um, 
Oh, God. I, th I think the strongest message, or at least the one that had the most impact on me, um, and still does sometimes. I mean, my shadow still shows up in this place. Uh, a man has to be right. He has to be right the first time. And he has to be right the first time without help. And if if not, then he's wrong. And so there are still times when if I don't have the right answer or I don't quite know what I'm doing or um, whatever, or I have to ask for help, it's like somehow or other that brings up this, this failure story uh, inside myself. And, and, uh, and I have, I, I mean, my father and I really came to love each other toward the end of his life and, and really came, got to be very close, partly because of my recovery, I think. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I really had a lot of compassion for what he went through that led him to that. I mean, his father was a brutal man. Yeah. And, um, so, my dad was was doing the best he could with what he had. It just wasn't the fathering that I needed to become the George that I was capable of being. Right, right. Yeah. It it sounds like, again, similar to to my my path. Uh, there there came a time that I forgave my father and was able mm -hmm. to, you know, he's still alive. He's eighty one, and I just visited him not not too long ago and i see him with different eyes that used to be um eyes of uh, hatred uh, of anger and now i see him through eyes of, of love because of that forgiveness and that it all has to do with being so sober and, and doing that that work on myself and um you know he like your dad he did the best he he, he could and it was a lot better than his father. His father was brutal too, uh, physically abusive, men uh, emotionally, mentally, verbally abusive. So in some ways, it, se it seems like our fathers set us up to break the cycle. Of it's a beautiful family. way of putting it. It's a beautiful way of putting it. Yeah. You know, consciously or unconsciously. Exactly. I, think, I yeah. think my dad knew, he definitely knew that what his father had done to him was wrong. I think on some level, he knew that what he was doing with me was wrong and didn't know how not to. Right. And I think that was part of his reclusiveness and part of his pulling away after some level of abuse. Uh, he would pull away and we'd become strangers. And uh, even even when I was young and still living at home uh, and um and he he went deeper and deeper into his own addiction, right. because I think I think the way he was living was intolerable to him. Right. Excuse me, was intolerable to him, and um, so yeah, it um, ultimately I think he he did find ways to set me up to push him away. Uh, I think he set me up. Um, to find my own path and um and in and later in life i found out that when he was younger um our paths were actually fairly similar mm. uh, i was studying with shamans in the south pacific in world war ii i didn't know that until i was until literally three or four months before he died wow and he died at age 83 really yeah, that is amazing. That is amazing. <laughs> Isn't that something? Oh gosh! So, yeah. So he he knew, and he didn't know. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 You know, one one of the challenges that I had, and the messages I received, and, and I'm curious to to hear if you had some of the same messages about what it means to be a man. And this I learned from my father is not uh, not expressing feelings emotions uh, not being vulnerable not crying um, absolutely and not being, absolutely. yeah and not being sensitive and i could see in my father that he was a very sensitive man 
but was afraid to express it because he probably was criticized and, and humiliated for it, like I was with him. Um, mm -hmm. Yet, yet that was in him, um, and I, and he just like like you said, your, your father didn't know how to to foster that in his son, uh, me, and um, but I was able to do that on my own. Yeah, yeah. So, and my dad. Prior to World War II, my dad was a, uh, an artist and a musician. And he had to hide his art because his father couldn't tolerate having a son who would be uh, such a sissy as to paint. Music, you know, music was one thing, particularly because he played trombone and, you know, you can play it loud and it's got some masculine, you yes. know. You're, yeah, it's you a big know. instrument. and yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's brass and it's yeah, yeah. okay to be brass and yeah. all of that. So so the music was one thing, but uh, but he painted in watercolor, which is one of the hardest mediums to paint in. And when he went to world when he went uh to the war, um he he was field promoted to a captain and had to send some of his men into a situation where he knew that few if any would come back alive and the and in that moment he made the decision that he would never paint again he would never feel to that depth again and when he came back from the war he tore up everything that he had that he had painted and um and he also de demolished his instrument and never painted never played music again yeah. so that sensitivity both from his father, from the war, from all the things that it means to be a man, you know, and being tough and all of that. Um, he couldn't tolerate it inside himself. Mm. And um, and again, because of the war, he had P PTSD. And, and late, late in his life, maybe a year, two years before he died, uh, I, I, I saw him look scared. He looked terrified. I'd never seen that in his face before. I said, Dad, what's wrong? What, what You look scared. What's going on? And he said, I didn't have the nightmare last night. And I said, what nightmare? He said, since, since um, an incident in World War II, and he was actually talking about the incident where he um, sent the men to, to die, but he, did, he didn't identify that at first. Um, he said, since that incident, uh, I've had a nightmare every single night. And last night was the first night I didn't have it. And that terrifies me. Yeah. His PTSD had become such a part of him. And I think that happens for a lot of us men, that the abuse we experience, the messages we experience and so on, when we don't hear that, when we do hear some kind of softness or when we are well received or there is some kind of of positive reception we feel lost we don't know what to do with it and that's one of the reasons why i do the work i do uh, with men and i think the reason one of the reasons you do the work you do with men is so that we can have both there's nothing wrong with having the armor no but we need to know when to take it off right you need that to be okay absolutely yes yeah yeah yeah, and, and I feel we, we as men need to have that balance of that sensitive, uh, maybe what people would consider feminine uh, side. Uh, we need to be comfortable with those parts of ourselves, yet have the balance with the masculinity, like I said, in the armor and the toughness. Uh, we, we need that fierceness also. Um, yeah. Um, I think it's, it just makes us more whole as men if we can embrace all parts of ourselves. Without. Well, exactly. And and even for the guys who, you know, a lot of us are taught that you can't have any feminine and, and you know, that just got to stay away from that altogether. Well, let's change the language a little bit just right. for a moment and talk about yin and yang. Yes. You know, talk about the active, uh, creative, um, you know, more more demonstrative energy. Yep. And that's Yang. Yep. And the more receptive and and embracing and holding and, and nurturing energy, which right. is the yin. Right. And leave masculine and feminine right. out of it altogether. Exactly. And still, 
we can still be all of that. Right. Yeah. 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 Without without labeling what's feminine, what's masculine, and you're right. You're right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. One of the conversations we had when we talked uh, previously was about the the shadow work. We talked about shadow work, and, and I'd like you to talk more about what what that is. And I, I actually sent you. I, I like to to collect quotes yeah. and i sent you a, after our conversation i it's what we spoke about sounded so familiar so i went back to my quotes and i found exactly uh, what i was thinking about uh, regarding our conversation i'm just going to read the, the the first paragraph every one yeah, of us has a shadow aspect the dark and unhealed part of ourselves that we would rather not see let alone address However, at some point in our lives, we must be forced to look at those places buried within us that we fear the most. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, all those hidden, repressed, suppressed parts of us, that, that's what comprises the shadow. And, and I even feel the oppressed parts of ourselves where, where we feel shame or whatever we we can't put that part out put that part of us out for the world to see i think that's that's equally a part of the shadow but I, you know i i loved what you sent and and so i have i have it right here on the screen with me so i can see it uh, and the next line the first line of the next paragraph i absolutely love nothing brings up our shadow like a good old fashioned personal crisis and that's what the addiction and early recovery was for me. That's what, you know, I just went through cancer. And and what's, what's interesting, Ed, and I, I wouldn't have suspected this if I hadn't lived through it. You know, it's, it's one thing to hear it from others, but to actually experience it is so different. It wasn't the addiction that taught me about the shadow. The addiction was the shadow. It wasn't the cancer that taught me about the shadow. That was an expression, a physical expression yes. of my shadow. Yes. It wasn't my depression that was the shadow. I mean, they were shadow, but they didn't teach me anything about, about shadow. What taught me about the shadow was the recovery. Right. And the, all the things that we go through, because particularly with addiction, there was a reason I became an addict. Because my life was so intolerable, that made more sense. <laughs> right. For a while. Right. And there's a reason that I developed cancer because I didn't know how to receive love. I didn't know how to take it in and really embrace it. And so that old question about what's eating you, well, I wound up eating myself, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And and so on. And and now I'm dealing with it to a degree with my wife's uh, dementia mm -hmm. and noticing the parts of me that are becoming exposed as i'm uh as i'm dealing with her her wounds and the parts of her that she's losing and that i'm losing of her right and it's bringing up another piece of shadow for me and the parts where i want what i want what i want it and 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 um i don't like the fact you know i i hate the fact that i'm losing someone i love and yeah. and and I want to be able to control it. And I feel powerless and, you know, all the things. So, um, so I love working. I love doing shadow work because it is about recognizing that the shadow itself is not the problem. It's the uh, resistance to feeling the feelings that we feel, to seeing the aspects of ourselves that, that we may not like, or we may feel, shame about or what have you that's the problem and um and once once people start to recognize once i start to recognize you the people that we work with that these are all just aspects of ourselves uh you know it's like going into a dark room and everything's kind of scary because it's a dark room we turn on the light and all, all of a sudden everything is is fine you know there's nothing to be afraid of turn the light off again and we don't go back to we don't stay with everything's fine we go back to oh my god what where is everything you right. know right. we go back to that fear 
And so one of the shamans that I worked with down in Peru, he said, you people from the West, you, you're just so funny. Um, he says, you, 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 um, you always want to bring light to the darkness. And you want to bring what's in the darkness out into the light. If you just learn to see in the dark, you'd stop being so afraid. Yeah. And that's the shadow work. That's powerful. Learning to see in the dark. That's powerful. Click the link in the description to receive your free ultimate guide for men over 45. Unlocking the 10 secrets to a fulfilling life. Yeah. yeah. Do you do you feel that the, the crisis that we experience that allows us to do that shadow work is like a symptom? That's the symptom? Um, well, yes, yes. And, and it's more. Yeah. Um, it's the, it's certainly the symptom in terms of the indication that there is something in shadow. Right, 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 <laughs> right. Know? Exactly. Um, but when we recognize the symptom, it's also the wake up call. Yes. You know, and, um, you know, when, in, in my own addiction, becoming homeless, that was, that was kind of the wake up call or one of the wake up calls for me. Um, and, um, you know, it, it just, I, I looked around the city that I was in at the, at the time and I said, what the hell am I doing? You know, I never signed up for this. All I wanted to do was, was feel safe, secure, make a difference in the world, make, you know, have a family, have a life. That's all I wanted. And, um, and instead, the the pains and the terrors and the overwhelm became too much. And I, I went further and further and further into the abyss of oblivion uh, to the point where I couldn't function practically. Yeah. You know? So, yeah. so that abyss would be the shadow and, and recognizing it is the first step out. Right. You know? Right. And generally when we begin that work or when we're dealing with that crisis we don't see what a gift it really is until sometime later when we can look back and see how much we've learned about ourselves through that process of of looking at the shadow and 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 dealing with it so um, i mean that's the way i see my my addiction uh, mm -hmm. That's the way I've seen illnesses and injuries I've had throughout my life. Uh, I might be at first be pissed off about it or, um, you know, just really angry about it. But then I, I sort of shift my thinking about it. Like, what is the lesson that I need to learn from this crisis? Um, yeah. That's not always easy. It isn't. It isn't. And and I think that's I think that's one of the struggles that that a lot of guys have is is um, is being able to see past the event or the experience and 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 see okay what what am I missing what don't I have or or what what do I need in order to. Uh, in order to work with this, you know, one of the things that I say to the guys I work with, um, if we don't allow ourselves to have our feelings, our anger, our sadness, our shame, our joy, our love, if we don't allow ourselves to have our feelings, our feelings are going to have us. And then we have no control. And so then the anger takes over and, yeah. and the sadness takes over and so on and so forth. And so can I can I have the experience of of the feeling of the uh, and and get out of the story of it? Right. You know, we we immediately go to the story of look what they did to me and this is why I, this is why that happened and so right. on and so forth. And that rolls around inside of us and we never get to have the feeling. Right. Because we keep getting into the into the blame game of the story, whether we're blaming somebody else, blaming life or blaming ourselves or yeah. blaming God. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's, it's learning to tell a different story. I mean, that's a great, great way to look at it. You know, we, uh, you know, I, I've heard that those memories are like well ingrained in our neural pathways. 
Yeah. And what we want to do is we want to uh, tell a different story that's going to be more more ingrained, deeper ingrained than the old story. So you don't keep yeah. on repeating it. Yeah. Yeah. I learned a wonderful little uh, exercise about that. I don't know if you've heard of Thich Nhat Hanh, the oh, yeah. Buddhist, yeah. Yeah. yeah, wonderful, wonderful teacher. And mm -hmm. um, the world lost a great man with him. But mm -hmm. um, but one of his one of his teachings was with whatever you're feeling, whether it's um, what we would call positive or negative, uh, there really aren't any positive or negative feelings. They're all teachers. But he, let's say anger is an example. So he'd be really angry about something or at somebody. And he would imagine that the feeling itself, not the experience, not, not what pissed him off, but the feeling itself was a little baby. And he would cradle it in his arms and he'd rock it. And he'd say, hello, my darling anger. You've shown up in my life today. What do you need from me? And what are you offering me? I mean, what a different way to approach something that, I mean, most of us get angry that we get angry. Right. <laughs> or again, we want to blame whoever made us angry. Right, right, right. But to approach it from this standpoint of, wait a second, the anger actually has something to teach me about me and who right. I am as I'm. Right. And if I can respect it that way and teach it with, I mean, hold it with respect and with compassion for right. myself and for the feeling, th that's going to have a whole different impact on my life. Right. Right. I'm I'm actually currently reading his book of short stories. Ah, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> and not too many real not not too many people realize it, but but long before he became famous for writing what he was writing, he wrote uh, poetry and illustrated it with with the very, very sometimes dark drawings, ink drawings, uh when he was living in Vietnam right. during the time of the Vietnamese War. Yes. A very powerful stuff yes and yeah actually at the beginning of each of his short stories are his his paintings ah his wonderful you're right i mean i mean because he lived he lived during that war he was there he saw the atrocities and the the, the murder and the killing and um and some of the stories are about that um yeah. it's wonderful. amazing how every story teaches you a lesson yeah a lesson it's it's, a, it's amazing um yeah. in recovery what have you added to your life uh, as far as your own health and well-being? What sort of practices have you added that uh, have really helped you along the way? Early on, certainly meditation and yoga. You know, I had to I had to find a way to get back integrated into myself, and the yoga helped me get integrated into my body. Meditation into my uh, mind and my emotions and my spirit. Um, yeah, for a while, I went to church. Uh, obviously, for years, I went to uh, AA and other 12-step meetings. Um, still do sometimes. And um, so I really, I, I knew I needed to regain me and or or gain a piece of me that maybe I never even realized was there. Um, so so the first probably couple of decades was all about that and um but i've always been interested in the arts and and creative expression you know one of my uh my my mom told told the story of when i was when i was a kid she found me uh, coloring in a in a children's book that she had given me and uh, she said what are you doing you're wrecking the book I said no I'm finishing the pictures <laughs> so, <laughs> so from a very early age I just had this need to creatively express myself and um, so that's an integral part of my life now and it's an integral part of my work um, I do a lot of ceremony hence the drums um, and all kinds of other accoutrements around me. <laughs> um, and uh, and I paint in the studio side of this room is over that way. Um, and um, in recovery from cancer, I'd written a book um, 
I don't know if you can see it. It's oh, yeah. tiny yeah. over there. Uh, stone, stone warrior. Yeah. Um, to give the cancer uh, a way of expressing itself, the process of of dealing with the cancer, dealing with recovery, um, give it a way to express itself. And um, and what I realized was I never really gave the healing an opportunity to express itself. So I started painting the healing process. And um, what I noticed was that the images were all developing these wing-like characteristics in the paintings. So uh, so I started to call them my angels in the dark. And, um, and that they weren't really the healing process so much as the inner healers themselves. So I developed that into a retreat, into a workshop that I that I still do. In fact, I've got a couple coming up and teaching other people how to identify those inner wounds, you know, whether it's the addiction or or anger or rage or grief or even even joy and sad, joy and, and love that we have difficulty expressing. What's going on in here that we that we're afraid to express or don't know how to express and start there. And then in the painting process, allow the healers, allow the angels, allow the, um, the recovery process to express itself. And then use that as some kind of, whether you hang it on the wall as something to reflect on or use it as a um, altar, uh, something to meditate with, whatever, but to use it from that point forward uh, as a support system for yourself in in the healing process. Wow, that's so. That's, that's, that creative expression is really, I mean, it it's what I was born with. Yes, I think it's what I was born for. It's what I lost completely in addiction, and it's what recovery and cancer brought back to me. Right. Right. Yeah, it's, it's always amazing that the 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 crisis that that comes up, the the things that we heal from is then what we bring forth to help other people. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, and I know for me, you know, yours is that creative, that's that creativity, that's that that expression uh going in and and bringing out that creativity. Uh for me yeah. it's the the physical body. Um, yeah. healing through the through the physical body like like you early in recovery i got involved in, in yoga and i don't i had, didn't know anything about it i don't know how how or why i got connected to yoga but i did and this was back in the early 90s when it really wasn't uh, that popular and then slowly adding more practices like meditation and the breathing um, good nutrition and so those are the things i help men with that foundational yeah. practice of getting good sleep hydration exercise but also the emotional component you know dealing with your emotions and uh, learning how to be more vulnerable and and what you feed your mind is important you know feeding yeah. your mind positive inspirational motivational material uh, yep so uh so critical yes you know that that saying that came up with the advent of the computer garbage in garbage out yes you know, it's so true yeah. yeah you know what we what we put in is what we become absolutely absolutely and what we think is what we attract yeah <laughs> yep yeah so you had mentioned uh early in our conversation something about love and i think also, when it's all said and done, that's what it's all about. And we we need to, as men, and I'm still working on this. And I still have a lot of shame around things and uh, beat myself up about certain things that I've done in my past. Um, but we, when I'm learning to really try to love myself uh, more, and also in that process, I'll be able to have more to to share my love with other people and love other people. Um, yeah. Sometimes, it, sometimes I find that it's easier for me to to love others more than it is to love myself. And so I'm not sure if that's something that you've struggled with, or you see men struggling with that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And now I, I I'm touched by the fact that you're you're bringing this up 
just last night. My wife had already gone to bed. I I was listening to some music and uh, the song Monsters came on. I can't remember the name of the singer, but it's the song about the the guy singing to his dad and that it's his turn to take it to protect his dad from the mm. monster. And um and I burst into tears. And you know, I I I thought about, you know, Dad, I I yes, I I am I still have some anger and I not resentment anymore. I think I've worked through that, but I have some uh angry moments and and things about what you did to me. And I love that we healed that. And I wish I could have done more for you. Right. You know, and um and it's it's really for me, it's a, a version of what you're saying. Um I've become pretty good at being able to do loving things for other people. I I, I feel I don't think proud is the right word, but I feel right-sized. I feel in a good place about the loving things that I can do for others for the most part. It's not to say I don't still hurt people sometimes right. or do things I would love to have done differently. Right. Uh, but when that happens, I, I own it. I take responsibility for it and I make amends. Right. But what is difficult for me and what I realized in my tears last night is that I'm still having trouble forgiving myself for how I treated my father. I've forgiven him for how he treated me, but I haven't forgiven myself for how I treated him. Wow. And and um, that's the next piece for me. That's the taking in right. of love, including from myself. Right. Wow. That's uh, that's powerful. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, you're right. I need to forgive. I mean, I carried hatred towards my father my whole life until till I felt like I forgave him. But yeah, you're right. I mean, that's what a waste of precious love. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I didn't like like him and like your dad at, at one time. We didn't know any better. Yeah, so that's the only that's that was generational. He, I mean, yeah. he he carried that same hatred and, and anger towards his father. So uh, what a gift through sobriety that that we're able to release that that piece and see our fathers differently. And, you know, I one of the tools I use was psychotherapy. I was involved in with a great therapist for for many years, and I brought my dad to a session and. I saw the vulnerability in my father mm. on a deep level because he said the thing he feared the most was dying alone. I know my dad had that vulnerability, but that was the first time he had ever expressed it. So for me, it was a lot easier forgive a man that could be vulnerable absolutely um, so uh, that was that was a gift and now you know I, I he's in a he's in a uh, rehab so I got to see him a couple weekends ago and he fractured his pelvis and I you know I, I see him uh, much differently and I'm so so grateful for that um, mm -hmm. so that's a gift just Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. It touches me. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're a good man, George. Um, you, uh, the, the, the strength and courage that it's taken you to get sober, uh, continue to do this deep, inner work and now the dementia with your wife and your your cancer each one of those is making you stronger and each one of those crises is giving you a greater ability to help others and that's thank you that's the sense i get uh, in this conversation 
from you. I, you know, one of the things that I think we've lost as men because we're so disconnected from ourselves is our intuition. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I'm speaking from my intuition now about you. Um, and it's a, it's an honor to to have met you and to have these conversations because I I feel that it's important for other men to to hear two men having a conversation like this mm. because not many men have that ability to to ha to hear a conversation like this from other men mm -hmm. they, don't think, they don't think it's possible yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well it, for them and it, you know for so many yeah. it isn't because they've never had the experience of it right and first of all thank you for for your intuition and for your vulner vulnerability and 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 for allowing this this conversation that we're having to be you know very intimate on mm -hmm. on the level that it is and um and the, for some reason I'm I feel compelled to say that for any guys who are listening who are feeling like well not me you know you guys are you know you're talking about yourselves whatever it is not me i'm not either i'm not ready for this or i don't believe this or whatever i say fine own where you are right and own it without shame and own it without blame and love yourself in that you know, if you need to have the armor on, then love the arm. Just be conscious. Just be conscious of it. Right, right. This is what I'm choosing rather than this is what life has done to me. Right. Because the moment, I believe, that the moment we can do that, the moment we can choose, uh, you know, I choose not to have George's way or not to have Ed's way, but to have some other way. The moment we choose that, we start to get our power back and all those old messages no longer start to make sense. Right. You know what I mean? I do. Does that make sense uh, to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would like to add to that. I, I, I think that, you know, like you said, everyone has their own path. It's not going to yeah. be George's way or, or Ed's way, like you said. And also, men who might be listening to this need to remember that you and I are talking about 30 to 40 years of 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 inner work that we've done of sobriety yeah. of uh, continued personal development um, so I would just say to you, you men that it's baby steps just take babies it's it's baby steps it's it's you're not going to go from where you are now to where George and Ed are now not that you might not even want to be there, but um, but it's your own baby steps that are going to get you to where you want to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Absolutely true. Well, and thanks. I think also notice notice the notice your lighthouses. Notice the people who this this was this was a powerful thing for me, and I mentioned my sponsors. Um, a powerful thing for me was was the lighthouses in my life. It was I, I was seeing people who, if I could, if I knew how, I aspired to be my version of that. You know, and and that's the direction to take those baby steps. Yeah. <laughs> not the not the baby steps toward what I think I should be or what other people say I should be, but what are the what are the baby steps I can take in terms of what really inspires me right. as a man I would like to be? Right. Great, great point, George. Yeah. Yeah. What is my truth? You know, what is my passion? Yeah. Not yes, that's great, great point. Well, George, it's uh it's been great, great conversation. I, I'm so uh grateful for you appreciate you and uh if someone wanted to get in touch with you how would they how would they do that do you have a website yeah the website is easy it's georgeherrick.com okay um it's in the process of being rebuilt but it's still it's still up so it's available um and um 
I don't know if you if it's okay to put out an email, but I'm fine receiving emails. So yeah, whatever whatever you want. What what's the best way to for people to get in touch with you? That's yeah, okay. So George Herrick three three zero at gmail.com. And I'll I'll uh, put I'll put both of those uh in, in the description so people can can reach out to you if they want. Great, great. Awesome. Thanks again. Thanks again. Uh, Appreciate it. Thank you for having great, me. Great conversation. Thank you. This feels like it was a sacred space. I, yes. I really feel uh, grateful, grateful to have been here. Yeah, thank you. If you enjoyed this video, check out my other video on self-love. I'll see you there.